Hi everybody, it's uh, Paul here. Got my granddad here with me as well today. I'm actually at granddad's as you can see. Um, the whole point of this video today, guys, is it's going to be about my blog. Um, I did a mental health blog. Uh, well, it's basically a story blog about my life back in uh, March this year, um, which I sat down and, and spent the whole day doing, really. Um, a fair few of you have been in contact in the last few weeks, wanted to know about what I've been through, about my childhood experience about the mental health that I've suffered and still suffer with. Um, so I wanted to share my blog with you today. Uh, there's been a fair few of you that have received it via an email which you've requested, um, but I just thought it'd be easier if I did a, um, a video blog, which I can read off the uh, iPad here, so you guys can sort of watch here tonight or whenever you feel free if you if you wish to. Um, so I'm gonna go through it now. I'm gonna sort of read my blog from the, from the tablet. Um, any feedback would be amazing, guys. Um, it'd be really um, be beneficial, yeah. To you know, to me, it would mean a lot to me. Yeah, it's going to be emotional reading this. Uh, I say I'm with my granddad here as well. This is not going to help. Um, but yeah, any feedback would be great. But more importantly, I'm doing this to help in any way. If it's relating to any of you that are out there with mental health, with childhood experiences, um, yeah, get in touch. If if it relates to you in any way or it touches you in many ways. Get in touch. It'll be really good to have a, a conversation with you guys. All right, <clears throat> so I'm going to start, guys. I'm going to um, read it now. So it's going to be a while. Um, I've got seven pages to read here. So I just appreciate you taking the time out to, to watch this video. Right, my mental health journey. So I'm writing this blog story to give you all an awareness and understand of my struggles uh, from when I was a child to this present day with my battles of mental health and to give you an understanding of me as a person. I hope this helps you or anyone that may be reading this and please do share to anyone who may benefit. So, me, Paul. I was brought up by my parents in Plymouth in a broken and emotional home which my parents deeply struggled to raise me in a, as a child for many, many reasons. The main reasons that I can remember about being a child is that I was never accepted as a son and not loved in, in that way or, or any way which I should or be deserved to be loved, nor was I even accepted as a son by my parents, which any child deeply craves and needs. I was often told that I wasn't planned, that I wasn't a problem, that I was a problem child and also a failure, and I was also told that I was not worth anything. To experience this when I was growing up is understandably damage, damaging for myself and this affected me within my home, school and social environments. My mother protected me. She was the wall between myself and my father. My father was abusive in every way. He was controlling. He had control of everything, over money, emotions and so much more. We went without food, help. We went without food, uh, heating and so much more that a stable, loving home would uh, need. The money and income would be for his drinking, for his addiction, stroke pleasure, and we went without. As a result, I was small, gaunt, and behind in every way in regards to my childhood and upbringing. My education suffered, my friendships with my peers suffered, and I was living alone in isolation, being locked in my bedroom for long periods after school and even weekends. This, of course, caused me with mental health within me, if it's with isolation, and obviously more with mental health suffering. There would be times, even at my young age, I'd have natural survival skills. In fact, I used to pinch money from my mother's purse and every Monday of each week, brackets her gyro payment, so I could sneak to the local shops to stock up on bread, biscuits, and anything else that would last me through the week ahead. This would be stored under my bed and this would keep me going. I would often have crisp sandwiches and cakes. This at an early age was achieved naturally. I look back to this day with both proudness and shock at the initiative and awareness I had to achieve these skills. I would often set my alarm clock for 4am when I would walk the streets where I lived and pinch the milk from doorsteps and even pinch clothes off neighbours gardening clotheslines. I deeply regret this and I'm writing this as I'm writing this but I had to do this to stay alive, to have decent clothing so I could avoid even more bullying at school and to have nutritious milk inside of me which I needed. Leading on to bullying now, this affected me badly and I mean badly. I was always the black sheep, always the one that sat in the corner within a sport activity or drama play. 
I refused to get changed in the changing rooms for football matches at school due to the abuse at home. So for me, I experienced trauma and abuse from home and now my school. This was secondary school. I often come into school with black eyes, grazes on my arms and so much more, but nobody approached me or noticed. I deeply wished at the time somebody could save me and notice if, if I'm okay, but ne this never happened. I was too afraid to speak. Due to the environment at home, this affected my education. I wouldn't concentrate, I couldn't sustain friendships from, en from any angle of my environment. I would even suffer in silence in every way. It was one summer's day at around five o'clock in the evening when my dad started his normal behaviour of abuse towards me. I was 13. I was able, able enough to experiment and actually answer back this time and ask my father to stop hitting me, but with more emotion. However, my father reacted even more so and, and as a result, he beat me black and blue in the house with a broom. However, for the first time, I could see an escape. The back door which was rarely open but locked due to my father's clever tactics, was actually open this time. So I ran. I ran as fast as I could outside whilst bleeding and in pain stroke tears. And I was free. My first day at primary school, 1986, is, is a picture that's on my blog. So if any of you want to see pictures of me as a kid, I can, I can send them as well. My neighbour, who I rarely spoke with or even saw, was there gardening. He saw me. He saw me straight away and noticed that I was in pain blooded and even abused. He gave his hands, I accepted, and I was then in the garden, in his garden, and felt immediately safer in his environment, despite only being in the next garden. My father had the look of sheer shock and despair, which I have never seen. He went back inside in, in the house, and I would never see him again. My neighbour Harry was warming, something I'd never felt, and he offered me a soft drink and biscuits. He gently asked what had happened. I explained with tears. I remember Harry locking the doors in the house and he picked up the phone in the other room and then the next minute the police were there. I was in shock. I was confused, but these new faces around me made me feel safe, made me feel that I could cry, talk and even be accepted without any fear of attacks. I've never felt this ever. I talked. I opened up about being in my bedroom for long periods. I told the police with guilt that I pinched clothes, milk and money from my mum. They reassured me that, they, that I wasn't in trouble. I felt I could trust and open up further with the reassurance and, and acceptance. So I did, lots and lots, about everything. I stayed with Harry for two days. He was amazing. I was in his home where I felt so safe and warm. This added to my healing and to talk and trust with Harry. Within that week, I was visited by a very caring and approachable man called Ken who worked for social services and would be my new social worker. Uh, <clears throat> he explained that I would now be supported. At this point, I was overwhelmed here with people around me now, even more, treating me with normal and loving care, which I wasn't used to. Ken explained that I would be moving, that I would be living with a new family who would look after me. I couldn't believe this. To, joy, to, joy, to digest and feel new emotions with confusion was tough to accept, but more of a relief here and a chance in life now to start a new life, which I deeply craved. <clears throat> Excuse me. I met with my new foster family. They were welcoming and warming from day one. When I entered their house for the first time with nerves and anxiety, there were, there were also two sons and a daughter, it were, and, a, and a beautiful collie breed called, called Jade. This was an alien world to me, but naturally this was safe, and I absorbed the energy and feeling straight away. We would... We would all sit at the table eat every evening and at dinner, which was new to me and extremely scary as I would often eat dinner in my bedroom previously in isolation. I was encouraged in every way in my new foster home with love and support. I started to blossom. I started to concentrate at school. I had a purpose now and belief. I had hobbies for the first time also. I started to play football and cricket, encouraged by my support and lo loving foster family, especially my father. I joined my first Saturday football team at the age of 14. I was able now to get changed in the changing rooms. I was able to make friends, but more importantly, I didn't feel like I was the black sheep anymore. This was because I'd been invested in and loved. From, this, from the care I received from my new home, I started to feel that I could finally be the person I wanted to be for so long without the troubled environment and battles I had to face. 
My head teacher in my early years of secondary, before my foster care, openly told me, brackets while I was in detentions, detentions, that I would be a failure and on the streets due to my behaviour and performances at school. This has also lived with me. I explained and opened up to my foster parents about this, as well as my upbringing and of course with memories, etc. I achieved seven GCSEs at the age of 17, brackets my final year with foster care, and I proved to my head teacher and my father that I am capable, that I have the potential, that I am indeed not a troubled and not a problem child. It was purely the environment and upbringing that I was experiencing. These achievements were due to the change in my environment and this was due to being invested and loved in by my social worker as well as my foster parents. I wish I could see my head teacher now as I'm writing this with a big smile on my face. My next chapter in, and path in my life was at the age of 17 when I moved into a semi-independent living house with a landlord called Richard. This was encouraged and supported by social services. I never looked back from this and also being within this new transition of my life. Richard, who I only met with today, as with today as I'm writing this to you now, is an amazing man. A man with so much life experiences himself, who could see the potential I had to live independently, to learn new life skills and obtain education and employment. From day one, when I moved in, I got stuck in. I applied for my first income with benefits. I achieved college courses, applications on my own accord, with Richard in the background, supporting and encouraging my daily needs in every way. This was amazing for me and the setup I had with my own money, independence and new beginning would give me more confidence. I lived with Richard for three years and I never looked back. I achieved so much with cooking for myself, budgeting and new life skills as I said earlier. I was given a choice here which is more important to me. More importantly Richard would invest in me in time and helping with his listening and patience and we would often get to the root of the problems with my triggers from childhood and upbringing. <clears throat> this was hard at times and there were tears but we revisited and revisited again and when I was ready to explore and, and, and to open up like I did it did get easier and for me each session we sat down it did get easier. I started to heal slowly and understand about my childhood and the behaviour behaviours with me. The awareness of understanding my triggers at behaviours is and still is crucial. There was no confusion anymore there was more of an understanding. After moving from Rich after four years, I moved into my first ever flat with independence, a full independence. I had my first serious relationship also within this time of transition, which I would encounter new emotions and triggers. I'd also be successful in obtaining employment, for which I served 14 years service with my employer. I had experienced bullying within, within my first employment role for long periods and situations in my 20s. This was due to the many, many factors that were out of my control, which would include myself being quiet and isolated and seen as a vulnerable target and also having down days on a regular basis, being consistent with my work behaviour, stroke workload, all again due to mental health and triggers that I was faced with. The struggles and experience were a mixture of my own mental health suffering, but also the limited support and understanding both of my employer and fellow employees within myself. Mental health awareness and mental health first aid training was non-existent back in the noughties. There was even more of a massive stigma at that time, being in a male-dominated environment also. So for me, I had to just try and get on with it, suffer in silence and suffer also with my work performances for so many years due to my mental health. I was seen as a failure and a problem. <coughs> Excuse me. I was even sent out to various offices and various departments as nobody could accept or understand me. I was not even understood or listened to and my, and my undeserved reputation would enhance. This would affect my childhood triggers again, hence why my mental health would suffer. My sickness ab absence in work would be higher than other employees and I would often be called back in for a back to work interview regularly. But the vicious cycle would continue as there's no understanding, no adjustment or awareness despite me opening up, saying that the reasons were due to bullying and in my environment, etc. It came to a point where my mind and feelings stroke frustrations would be too much. I suffered a breakdown at the age of 32. I wasn't understood, I wasn't listened to, and I exhausted all avenues and support I tried to obtain. I hit rock bottom. I started to get suicidal thoughts as a result. I planned then to take my life. 
I set my alarm clock for four o'clock in the morning so I could be on the, my local high bridge, which is called Tamar Bridge, so nobody could see me or save me. I sat on that bridge for an hour or so. Somebody cycled past me and asked if I was okay. I didn't reply due to my non-focus and being non-existent and lost. <clears throat> the passerby sat with me right by my side and gently asked what's going on. I'm here to listen with no ju judgment, he gently continued and replied. I looked at him and looked at him and started to cry. I felt there was a safe place to open up there and then and I felt like I could let it all out. He put his arm around me and I knew then that there was somebody there to listen and understand a little, giving me vital patience at that time. This was crucial for me at this present time also obviously with, with the situation I was in. I was at the hospital. Once the emergency services arrived, I was, I was supported and in the presence of the mental health support team. I finally had people around me that would understand and listen. I quickly received long-term counselling funded by my employer, employer's welfare officer, Rachel. Rachel will probably be watching this, so hello Rachel. He was amazing around me and was the only person within that employment that had the time and day for me. <clears throat> I had around 25 to 40 sessions over periods of counselling with an amazing counsellor who I felt comfortable with and had sustained a trusted relationship throughout the sessions. There was tears and emotions, of course. There was childhood drama, trauma, resurfaced. But what I experienced and learned with the counting and within my own mind and body was that I was actually revisiting my childhood and reassuring the inner child within me. I started to love my child in me and loving and reassuring the child within, my, within myself. <clears throat> this dearly helped and I started to understand myself, my triggers, my mental health and what I needed to do in self-care and for my mental health awareness and understanding. I started to understand me. I started to accept that I have more men that I do have mental health issues. But more importantly, I started to talk and open up to people around me about this. This was my medicine right there. Uh, I was on antidepressants for, for ages and the doctor would just chuck tablets at me, but these never worked. Um, the actual fact is not being understanding, sorry, the actual fact is being understood, having that acceptance and talking is my medicine to this day, as I'm writing to, the, to you with this, and I still believe this. I eventually left my role with my empo employment. In fact, they made me redundant, which was proven to be a massive turning point in my life. I use this change as a new beginning. The change of being made redundant comes five years after my suicide attempt. Since my recovery and my mindset being a better place and gaining an understand, understanding, I wanted to give back to help others as well as helping myself. I achieved a level three in counselling CBT and CST so I can help myself further but also look to use this qualification and life experiences to give back and help others in the community. In 2017 I was reading my local paper one evening and I could see within that week there has been two suicides in the city I lived in. Two men within that week who had taken their own lives and jumped off the same bridge, which I also contemplated taking my own life. This deeply saddened me and I, I had me in tears and it touched me in every way, in so many ways. Within that week, so I was jogging, so within that week I was jogging on the same bridge, close to where my granddad lives, as I had been staying with him at the time. I could see somebody on that bridge ready to jump. I was there seeing him and I knew straight away with my instincts I had to reach out. I reached out calmly and assuringly exactly the same situation that I was put in when that gentleman reached out to me back in 2012. And I mirrored the same situation for that person needing help. We sat down for around about four hours talking and I, list and I listened with no judgment. This hit home for many reasons as you can understand as I went home that night <clears throat> and actually did a personal video on Facebook. For, to, for my friends to see what I experienced. I detailed on the video that what had happened and how this hit home, but more importantly, the massive problem we have here in society with mental health awareness and mental health, men's mental health stigma, um, including myself back in 2012. There were 15 of my male, fr male friends online that came, came and replied to me and, and the video, uh, who, who reached out and said they were, they were struggling with their mental health. I was shocked. It was from then on I had the idea and drive to set up uh, Males Allowed and put my feelings and experience on the, on the line in the community. Somebody needed to talk publicly within the community. 
Um, and I stood for many men and women that suffered in silence about their mental health, which I feel proud for. I contacted my local paper who published these two tragic cases of the suicide recently before I made contact, asking if I could share my stories and experiences, but also to drive my idea forward to set up a, a safe space for men and women to talk and reach out. I wasn't sure what the reaction would be with keyboard warriors and so on. I wasn't sure how this would go with the stigma, limited awareness and internet trolling. But the responses and reactions online were simply incredible and it made me even more determined and have that desire and drive to set up males aloud. This would be the platform for men and women to obtain help and support and not feel alone suffering in silence. Males Aloud has been in the community for two years. The drive and idea has gone from strength to strength with different ways and actions to raise awareness. This could be through a walk the talk group meets to carpool mental health chats. Guys are talking more and women reaching out in many ways with the service and availability of Males Aloud for the community. This has made me so proud. Males Aloud has reached out to so many people and Males Aloud will continue to thrive and grow more and more with awareness and support for the community. We have an amazing team of volunteers now, all with life experiences and mental health. Obviously that's changed guys and I'll go into that in, in detail. We're speaking with people in schools, colleges and group meets with the prevention awareness and experiences. This is very much therapy, but what I've found recently is that we can't pour from an empty cup and this doesn't work and it's not fair on anybody that I have support or anybody else. We have to self-care, change our environment and recognise that we need to have an awareness of making ourselves well and in control. I know this all too well only recently. I'm a devoted father and I love spending time with my granddad also. My advice is to use our family and friends for support and cherish new memories. If you're struggling in your workplace or even in your changing rooms for your support and sports team, sorry, have a conversation and reach out. Suffering in silence is deadly and this will only create a build up of emotions and triggers old and new. The stigma is breaking with social media especially. So many organisations like Males Allowed and so many other great um, charities and volunteers are talking more. Workplaces are introducing mental health first aiders. So people like myself that have limited support at the time and help can now go somewhere in an employment space for help and safe and space talk. This should be in schools and colleges as well. There is a long way to go of course and we all keep going but the more we talk and the more we are kind to each other the more we can prevent and, and, and have that help if it's at home or workplace or even a social meet. I find that family time is positivity and motivation. I'm very close to my granddad and my son and that makes me happy and we need to hold on to what we enjoy. I love walks, I love sports, so I participate in these hobbies also but with baby steps being the key. If you are struggling and having a bad day, week or month, then please have a good diagnosis of yourself and find in yourself what you like doing and what makes it feel good. It could be walking, it could be doing sports, it could be doing cooking. It's important to love ourselves to find an environment that makes us feel happy and content. Maybe you could try a new hobby or physical activity, like I just said, that you can look forward to. Another thing I like doing is keeping a diary, a things to do list. This can enable you to plan your week in moderation to your own speed and setting. It doesn't have to be much, but don't, but don't pressure yourself at the same time. You can make a list and diary realistically and achievable for yourself. This will help you. I achieve this every day, and I mean every day, without fail. Um, and I do this in moderation. We need goals in life. We need to have things to look forward to. But sometimes with our mental health, we think too much. We analyse and we can overthink. <clears throat> I hope this blog, background, and the reason of why I campaign for mental health has put some light for you guys. If that can relate to you in any way, <clears throat> please let me know. But that's basically my blog. Obviously, I, I was stuttering it in places because it was emotional. Um, <clears throat> but actual fact, that's my blog. And that's what I've been through. And that is why I, I do what I do. And that's the way I am as a person, giving back to the community. As you read there, Males Allowed was active. It's no longer active. Um, but as you guys know, I'm looking at doing other things now, other projects, other campaigning for the community. Because it's crucial that I give my experiences and desire back to the community. Because I know I can make a difference with what I've been through. Um, and I know I have a laugh with TikTok and 
quizzes and Instagram, but generally we've got to have some fun with, with what we're doing and campaigning. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it makes sense. Feel free to PM me at any time if that relates to you in any way. I want to give a massive shout out to you, Grandad. I want to give a massive shout out to you. Because you're, you're, you're not mentioned a lot in there. But you're the reason why I'm here. I know. You have saved my life, you know that. Yeah. This man has been there for me. 2012, when I had the breakdown. You know, the, the support this man's given me over the... Since I, oh, I, I, the words can't, I can't put words into it. I love this guy so much. I know I'll do wind ups and I know I, I, I have a laugh, but generally, this guy is my rock. And that's why, with my tattoo, um, the reason why the sleeve tattoo, <clears throat> you know, last year is to uh, put my heart on my sleeve. And all my family, my foster family, my granddad, my son, everything is on my sleeve because I'm proud of where I am in life. And yeah, um, and that's that's where I'm at, you know. Um, as you guys know, I've been struggling the last few weeks, uh, well, months to be honest. Um, but I just want to say a massive thank you to everybody that supported me via Instagram in the last few months. If it's with the quiz, the company, the messages, it really, really means a lot. Um, and I've been quite vocal with how Instagram has got me through some terrible times in the last few weeks. Um, and you guys have been amazing. So I hope my video has shed some light. I hope it relates to you in, in, in any way. Uh, if it doesn't, that's fine. But if it does, feel free to PM me. I'm always here for a chat and conversation. Um, and it is okay not to be okay. All right, guys. Um, I hope I haven't bored you to death. Uh, but I really wanted to do a video blog. Um, I know it's uh, death by PowerPoint reading it from a tablet. But uh, I hope it made any sense to you. And... Um, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching it this far. And um, for myself and my granddad, we say goodbye. Take care.